What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Saturdays in the SEC, episode 96. We're back here to uh, recap week eight. Um, had some really, you know, good matchups this past weekend in, in the SEC and nationally. So we're going to kick it off with the biggest game of the week in the SEC, Alabama and Tennessee. And I got to say, I was pretty nervous, you know, early on in this game, first half. Uh, I thought Tennessee really threw their best punches early. Um, had a really good game plan offensively. Thought Joe Milton played probably his best half of football uh, in his career, or, or certainly one of his best um, that that I've seen him him play. He was super efficient early. Thought he did a good job of kind of taking the green grass in front of him. You know, he had some nice scrambles, uh, lower his shoulder shoulder a few times to get some first downs. Uh, they came out firing. Um, you know, really kind of through the air, you know, because that obviously they were last in the SEC coming in and explosive pass plays. They were able to, you know, hit a hit a shot or two down the field. Squirrel White made made a great catch on the first touchdown pass, and um, you know they weren't able to really run the ball though that great overall. Um, but obviously they go into the go into the locker room up twenty to seven after scoring a late touchdown in the first half, and then. Um, you know, Alabama came out in the second half, obviously scored in two plays um, on their first possession, got back in that ball game quick, and obviously they scored 27 unanswered to win this game and, and, and win it 34-20. So, um, obviously that's kind of been a, a little bit of a theme for Alabama, you know, starting off slow in a lot of these games. Um, you know, I, I look at the Ole Miss game, the Texas A&M game, this game against Tennessee – a lot of slow first halves, but um, pretty dominant second halves for the most part. You know, going back and looking, if you take Alabama's best three wins against Ole Miss, Texas A&M, and now Tennessee, they've allowed six points total in the second half of those games. So they've been making great adjustments. Um, and I, I feel like, too, every time the offense has been pretty efficient, um, the defense has just fed off of that. You know, um, when the offense can either – you know, score on an explosive play or able to sustain a drive a little bit. That just feeds in the defense and keeps them rested a little bit. Really, the main times you've seen them struggle are when the offense is going three and out consecutively in that Arkansas game, for example. Um, you know, obviously in the in the Texas game, that was a that was a tough matchup, but you know, early on, I you know, Texas got the better of them. So um and and the offense kind of, you know, put them in some some deep holes there a couple times in that game as well. But um, but overall, yeah, I'm just super impressed and happy with the way the defense is playing. Um, obviously, the play of the game, uh, Chris Broswell with the strip sack of Joe Milton and, and Jahai Campbell runs it in for a touchdown. Um, just really kind of a, pretty much sealed the game. It felt like there was about seven minutes left, but that, that was a, the way Alabama's defense was playing. You felt pretty good at that point. That really – Kind of, kind of sealed it, but yeah, really impressed with the way Alabama's defense is playing. I, I'm, I, I continue to be thrilled with Kevin Steele. I think that was one of the best hires of the off season, to be honest with you. And I, I think a lot of people are, are continuing to wake up to to that fact. But um, you know, I thought offensively for Alabama in the second half, a little more creative in the run game, um, getting the ball in the perimeter a little bit more. Um, so it, that that was nice to see, you know. I te- I believe I texted you during the game or, or early on, and and like, man, Tommy Reese is just hammering this inside zone for a yard. I mean, we, I can't tell you how many times that <laughs> Alabama's done that this year, and it's like feels like you're taking a sledgehammer to the Berlin Wall, like it's just <laughs> just getting stoned um, about every time it feels like. But thought he did a better job in the second half, um, able to hit couple explosive pass plays as well, which has kind of been the staple of Alabama's offense, mainly when they're scoring, it's an explosive play. So, um, But overall, great second half. I think they'll take a lot of confidence from that. I mean, Tennessee had been playing really well, been trending in the right direction. They just couldn't quite hang or couldn't quite really move the ball for four quarters like they needed to. Um, but but overall, great win for Alabama. I think this, this bye week will um, – Served them well, you know, getting healthy. Uh, Terry on Arnold missed the second half um, with an injury. Uh, Tresman Marshall's been banged up. So there's quite a few injuries that that need 
you know, to need some recovery time. But I'm curious to see how Tennessee bounces back this week. They got Kentucky, who's kind of been on the slide a little bit. So I'm curious to see how they bounce back as well. Yeah, 100%. I mean, like you spoke about a few weeks ago, it might have been last week, Kevin Steele's halftime adjustments, man. I mean, he's knocking them out of the park. I know there's not really a whole lot of time to have adjustments, but what, what his game plan was going into that second half was a complete 180 of what it was in the first half. Uh, I felt like they made Tennessee's offense uncomfortable because they they had to rely more on the passing game. I mean, Joe Milton threw the ball 41 times this game for 200 yards. He had 28 completions. But they had to rely more on that passing game than they have all year, it, it felt like. And it just – you could see them, especially later in the second half, they, they didn't seem comfortable. They couldn't get anything moving. Bama shut them out in the second half. I mean, they absolutely dominated that second half of that game. But – that's the largest comeback in Bryant Denny in like twenty something years or something along those lines. It's uh it's I don't think Saban's ever had a comeback that big. Uh I could be wrong on that, but I don't think he's ever had a comeback that big in, in his time at Alabama. Uh so props to the the players and you know, hats off to the defense for for coming out with their hair on fire in the second half. But yeah, man, Kevin Steele is just lighting the world up uh on the defensive side of the ball and and in the second half, man, they are a completely different defense than what they roll out there at the beginning of the game. I, I don't know if it's just because they got to see what what the other team's giving them and, and how they're going to adjust to make make the to, to play better on the defensive side of the ball. But he's been doing having outstanding adjustments during halftime, and they they came out this game. Uh, I felt like Jalen Milrow finally turned the corner a little bit. Uh, I feel like you can rely on him a little more. He he did a lot better, especially going through his progressions. He he dumped it off several times, just took the little chunk plays they were giving him, and you know, realizing it's okay to punt. You know, it's we don't have to have the big play every single time. They didn't seem they weren't behind the sticks as much on third down, especially in the second half. Uh, like you said, their run game came alive in the second half for sure. But it just you can definitely see Jalen Milrow turning the corner and, and they're going to be a force to be reckoned with these last five weeks of the season for sure. Um, that I think the rest of their games are definitely winnable for sure. They'll probably be favored in every single one of them. So uh, you'll probably see Bama in the SC championship game again this year. Yeah, I, I think too with the, the defense in the second half especially, and I think it's been the theme in a lot of these games, but – Definitely got more pressure as the second, you know, in the second half, and as the game went on, was able to get, you know, get more pressure on the quarterback, and obviously that, you know, that's where it begins, man. You you got to, you know, when you when you're playing against good quarterbacks or you know good quality SEC quarterbacks, like you you got to get pressure on them. You can't let them stand back in the pocket because if you don't, you'll make an average quarterback look great um, against you. So that that obviously helped a lot and kind of offensively, too, um, you know, mentioned in the run game. I like the fact that they used the quarterback run game more this week, you know, and I, I mentioned this last week, I believe, but really since the Mississippi State game, Jalen Milrow's legs have been a non-factor, and that just – that shouldn't be the case. I mean, this this guy is like one of the most dynamic athletes in the country, you know, probably regardless of position. I mean, like, I mean, he is – a true weapon with his legs. I just think you're hamstringing this offense if you're not taking advantage of that and using that to your, you know, 100%. using that to your advantage. So um, I was glad to see a, a couple more zone reads. He was able to keep a couple of them when the ends would crash in and able to get a, get a few big gains. I thought he had some, I, I was glad to, you know, obviously you want your quarterback to go through his progressions, but there's a few times where he hasn't, I felt like he hasn't been decisive enough to, you know, to run, use his legs, especially on third downs. And there were a few third downs in this game where he went through his reads and he got to about his second one. And, you know, if he didn't have a spy on him, he was able to step up and, and be decisive and just go get the first down. And um, so I, I was glad to see that, you know, making a little bit quicker decisions because obviously sacks have been a big issue and, you know the offensive line has struggled. I feel I feel like they they've gotten better. You know Tyler Booker, J.C. Latham, they're they're both playing really good football, so that that helps a lot. But um, yeah, yeah, it was it was good to see him be a little bit more decisive. I think, and and, and like you said, he's getting a little bit more comfortable each time. He threw the ball away a couple times. I thought that you know that that was a good sign to see because. Like you said, when when you're a guy like that, too, your whole life you've been able to make a play. 
right. you know, at every, you know, at the high school level and early, like you, you've always been able to kind of bail yourself out when you're that kind of athlete. So you always want to wait to the last second, you know? So like you said, the work, you know, punting in this offense is not the worst thing in the world. And what got them behind, you know, behind in this game earlier was, was a couple turnovers. You got to, mm-hmm. you got to strip sack in the reds or deep in your own territory. The defense did great, though, to hold them to a field goals a couple times, which kept the game manageable. And then really wasn't his fault. It was a de- it was a decent throw, but, you know, it hits Jermaine Burton in the shoulder pad in the end zone. It's an interception. You know, so you had a couple turnovers that, that took points off the board or gave them an opportunity to score. So, um, you know, that that's things that you don't – that you can't have in this offense this year because it's not – an offense that's going to pull away from people very much. But I'm glad you mentioned the LSU game, too, and obviously we'll really talk about this more next week. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited for that matchup. I mean, it's really kind of the, the SEC West title game because LSU's only got the one conference loss. And I think they've turned a little bit of a corner, too. Defensively, they played a little bit better, uh, certainly from where they were. So, um, and obviously their offense is about as elite as anybody's in the country. So that's going to be a huge matchup. And that's a off, that's a game you're going to want to start fast in. You do not want to get behind and have to get in a track meet with LSU because Alabama won't win a track meet with LSU. So, um, but we'll we'll cover that more next week. But it, that's going to be an exciting matchup. But but overall, I think Alabama can take a lot of confidence for, from this win, especially the second half and. Uh, Tennessee still got a lot to play for, too. They've got a lot left on their schedule, starting with Kentucky, still got Georgia, um, still got Missouri. So uh, a lot of big gains left for Tennessee, too, and they they can really, you know, have an opportunity to finish strong as well. So I want to see how they bounce back against Kentucky this week. Absolutely. Uh, transition to the other team in the state of Alabama, down in Jordan-Hare, man, the offense is just – atrocious absolutely atrocious however i'm not like most opera fans are right now online and and like you hear and in calling into radio stations already calling for hugh freeze's head i mean hugh freeze has coached seven ball games for us and they're already calling for him saying he ain't the guy you know get him out of there what's he, what's his problem and i will say this ten thousand more times about this season You cannot be competitive when you inherit an absolutely trash roster. Not hating on the guys that are that are suiting up for Auburn. You know, I'm going to defend them till the end of the earth. But there's no way that Auburn fans saw the product on the field last year and thought, yeah, it's it's going to be that much drastically different this year. Now, Auburn has lost four in a row. And we talked about uh, in the previews, you know, how, how are they going to respond when they lose three or four in a row? Is, is it going to keep going downhill? Or are they going to, you know, tighten their, tin, tin, ooh, tighten their chin strap and, you know, be ready to roll and, and get back in the win column? And I think, you know, the next four games, they're, they're all winnable. You got Mississippi State, Arkansas, Vandy, and New Mexico State. So there's a very high chance that Auburn could win in the season with seven wins, which I said was their ceiling. I'm not sure that they will win all four of those games, um, but I definitely think that three of them are 1,000% winnable. I think this weekend Auburn has got to get back in the win column and do whatever they can to right the offense. But the the thing that I will say about the offense, I mean, <clears throat> Auburn, it, it's a, it was a one-score game when it ended 28-21, but the, the last touchdown Auburn scored was within two minutes. It was mop-up time touchdown. It was, Auburn got blown out at, at their own stadium. They, they got beat by two possessions, you know, regardless of what the scoreboard says. It was, like I said, mop-up time, touchdown. But the the dual quarterback system, man, it is it is driving me crazy. I understand you want both of them to play. One gives you a better option than the other in the passing game, and one gives you a better option in the rushing game. But the thing that drives me crazy is one of them will drive you all the way down the field and then you'll just yank them out and put the other one in. Like this past weekend, Robbie drove Auburn all the way down the field, and I believe it was third and one, and then they put Peyton in and handed the ball off. I'm like, what is going on here? I, I, 
I, I just don't see the reasoning of pulling the quarterback out when he's driven you all the way down the field. That that really drives me nuts. Like that's the, really the only complaint I've got about the dual quarterback system. You got to let one of them get in a rhythm for sure, ride the hot hand that game. But going in and out in the same drive, like pulling them back and forth in the same drive, is just is is baffling. I don't know what they're seeing. I don't know what the reasoning is. I haven't heard it explained yet. Uh, not in a not in a good way anyway. I just the the fact that Robbie drove Auburn down the field and then gets yanked out. And then there a couple of weeks ago, Peyton drove him all the way down the field and then got yanked out in in the side the red zone. And I'm like, what what is going on? Like I I just, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't know what, what Auburn's seeing. I don't know what Hugh Freeze and Philip Montgomery are seeing. Um I'm not calling for Philip Montgomery's head, but I would be surprised if he's in Auburn next year at the, at the end of this year. I think he makes the season, but I would be surprised if he's still in Auburn at the end of this year. But Man, defensive-wise, they did the best they could. They were on the field again a lot. Um, but Ole Miss just ran all over Auburn, up and down the field. There was multiple, multiple third and longs that they converted. Uh, there was like a third and 14 or something that they handed the ball off to Quinshawn, and he had – I mean, Ole Miss O-line, they they parted the Red Sea for him, and he ran up the side of the, the, the field, and he I think he gained like 20, 25 yards or something like that and ended up going into scoring uh, a few plays later. But – it's just not being able to get off the field on third down defensively hurt us this week and just not being able to, to sustain offensive drives also hurt. Uh, Jarquez had a really nice run, like a 58-yard, 54-yard touchdown run up the middle. It's like it, you see that happen. You're like, it can be done. It, it, we have seen it multiple times be done against good competition. I mean, they ran the ball for 200 yards against Georgia. It's Why, is, why can't it consistently happen? That's, that's what drives me nuts, but it, it's – Again, I'm not upset about it in any way, shape, or form in the fact that a lot of fans are because I have my head on straight and I uh, understood what this season was going to be coming into the season. Uh, like I said, ceiling, great season, seven wins this year. But I did expect Auburn to be more competitive in a lot of these games. And, again, it, it was a one-point uh, or one-possession loss, but it was it felt and looked way worse than a one-possession loss. Uh, it just it, it the, there's certain things that that are frustrating, but at the end of the day, it I was expecting Auburn to lose the game. Um, it's just the the way that they lose it is what's what's just frustrating in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, kind of addressing what you said to start off with about Hugh Freeze and stuff, and you know, I I mean, I even as an Alabama fan, I've been I've been very you know, honest and just really gave my honest opinion. Like, I, I thought Hugh Freeze would get this job. I, I think they made the right decision. I think he's done a really good job so far. Um, what he's been able to do to rebuild that recruiting, you know, infrastructure, if you will. Um, and you make a great point about the roster. If you look at the roster that Brian Horson inherited versus the roster that Hugh Freeze inherited, even that right there is a huge difference. I mean, like Brian Horson, okay, yeah, it wasn't the best roster, but like there were some pretty good pieces. Like Bo Nix was on that roster. There were Roger McCurry. SEC players on there. Yeah, Roger McCurry. Um, uh, the D line or defense end Hall. I Derek can't Hall. His first. Yeah. Derek Hall. Yes, Derek Hall. Thank you. I mean, there were several other. You know, uh, Tank Bigsby obviously on that roster. I mean, there were several legit NFL guys on that roster. This this roster does not have many of those guys. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, they had to go in the transfer portal and get, you know, who they could. But even the guys they did get, they weren't highly rated guys, you know, coming out of high school. They had, you know, been successful in college, but still not the quality of player that you, you're you going to get here in the future. So, um, you know, just the fact of we, we talked about how down the recruiting had been and those – relationships had you know had had faded a little bit when Brian Horson was there with with local high school coaches and 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 you know programs in in the state of Alabama and and just that that had really just fallen off a cliff so people and I don't think it's very many people calling for for Hugh Freeze's head I mean there's always fringe fans in every fan base that are a little you know over the top one way or the other but I'm like, okay, Auburn's sitting here at three and four. You've lost to 
Texas A&M, Georgia, LSU, and Ole Miss. They were not supposed to beat any of those teams. All nope. of those teams are have much better rosters than they do. And a couple of those teams are exponentially better rosters than you have. Mm-hmm. The only one that's even maybe in the realm would be Ole Miss. I mean, you're talking about Georgia, LSU, and A&M. Like, you're talking about three of the top 10, 15 rosters in football right there. Ole Miss has got a much better quarterback than you do. I mean, Jackson Dart's playing. I think his stat line really doesn't do him justice. I thought he played a great game. I mean, the stat line, you were, okay, 10 of 17, 202, one touchdown, one pick. But I thought he played a – I mean, he's playing at a really high level right now. He ran the ball extremely well. He was effective running the ball. Yeah, you know, Quinchon Junkins, obviously we, we know what he is. The receiving core, like Trey Harris had a great game. Like they've they've got good wide receivers, you know, on the perimeter. So I mean this and their their defense, I mean that you know, say what you want about Golding, but I mean their their defense I, I feel like has has got better. I mean, it's you know, it, it's definitely improved, or, or at least people in their program feel that it's much better than what it was before. So um, so yeah, I mean they're they're a pretty good team and and shoot, they're six and one and in the top fifteen right now. So, I mean, if you're Auburn with the roster that, that Hugh Freeze inherited, you're not supposed to beat any of those teams. Nope. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, you, you you can't, you know, create a miracle here. So, I mean, it's going to take some time. So, but as you said, though, going forward, um, I mean, they should be favored in their next four games. They're favored this week, uh, minus six and a half at home right now against Mississippi State. Uh, they go at Vandy. They'll be favored in that game. Out of Arkansas, the way they're playing, they'll be favored in that game. And then New Mexico State, obviously. So, if they, you know, do what, you know, people think, and and obviously if they're able to move the ball a little bit better against some of those teams, yeah, th- those four games are winnable. I'm like you. I think they at least win three of them for, for yeah. sure. Um, but but I, I think there's a good chance they could win all four. And then if you lose the Iron Bowl, that puts you at seven and five. So I mean, really, um, I said they had a chance to win, you know, seven, eight games, counting the bowl game. So that would put you in line for about what what was expected. So mm-hmm. um maybe even a little bit better than some people expected. So um yeah, I, I think these next four games, I'm curious to see how they do. Uh two of them are on the road. You know they got the home game this week against State, which will be big. They're they're above five hundred now, so that'll be interesting. But but yeah, I think anybody that's getting on him too much right now is just insane. Because I mean, you look what he's doing on the recruiting trail. Um, obviously, like you said, I know the the two quarterbacks is is a little you know weird, a little bit different. But I think they're just trying to find anything they can, you know. And I'm like you, I, I wish they wouldn't yank them out like in the middle of possessions, you know. It's just kind of feels like it messes up the rhythm sometimes. Especially when they're driving. Yeah, you know, I, I think you need to at least give them a couple series at a time, you know. Like if, say, you hypothetically you put Peyton Thorne in and you, he goes three or four series or three series, whatever, and, and it's not moving the ball, then put Robbie in for a bit, let him, you know, mm-hmm. but – I think like yanking them back and forth within drives is just kind of kind of weird, but uh, but yeah, I, I think they're just trying to find any kind of sport they can, and and like you said, just trying to find that hot hand. But I think at the end of the day, you just they're trying. You just got to pick okay, which which weakness will hurt us the least? I guess mm-hmm. you know what I mean. Like you're just trying to say like. Yeah, Peyton's a little bit better of a passer. Robbie's a better runner. But I, I really just – I don't think it matters that much. Like, I think they're almost – they're different strengths, but they're basically one and the same. Like, they're playing about the same level right yeah. now. So, I just don't think it's going to change much, regardless of who they who they pick. I think you just got to fit – you just got to think, like, okay, who can kind of fit our offensive strength the best and, and kind of roll with that. But – um, I do think Jarrick West needs to get the ball a little bit more. Thought he'd have one of his best games. Um, you know, he had a couple seams and had the long touchdown run, you know, scored inside the Reds or scored inside the five there on another play. So, I mean, that that's one of your best players on your entire roster. So, I do think they need to up his touches a little bit more. Um, I think he had 
what do you have, 15 carries or 15, 19? Yeah, yeah, yeah 15. 15 so, for 90 something yards. Yeah, I'd like to see him, you know, get, get it a little bit more. I felt like we said that over and over when Tank Bigsby was there, but, yeah. um, but you don't have a ton of horses on offense right now. Like he's the one guy that is a dynamic player for you. So, I'd like to see him get the ball a little bit more, and I think he probably will over these next several games as we go forward. But, but yeah, I think offensively, I don't think much is going to be corrected. I think you you just got to figure out, like, okay, who kind of gives us – you know, who can make the least amount of mistakes and who can we kind of maximize the most. But, yeah, anybody that's on cue right now, I, I think is way, way, way overblown and – um I think here in the next three or four games, if they take care of business, you know, like they should, I, I think he's going to end the year about what everybody thought, maybe even a little bit better than some thought, because obviously not many were high on him coming into the year. Absolutely. So, I mean, again, there's frustrating parts, but at the end of the day, he's got to weather the storm as best he can. The roster's just not there. He uh, he inherited a crap show. You know, he really did. So, it's just – he's doing about as good as anybody else would do. I, I don't really understand what people are expecting from the roster and from the guys that Auburn has playing for him right now. Uh, but just give him time, and, and, and he'll be there. This is no Kirby Smart inheriting a Georgia team that Mark Rick recruited well every single year. This is not a Brian Kelly inheriting an LSU team who recruited well every single year. Like it's it's not Dan Lanning and Herring, Oregon, who was a top fifteen recruiting team every year. Like these, this is a different roster that he has inherited. He's never had, in my opinion, at any level he's been at, he's not had this bad of a roster. So he's doing about as good as anybody else in the country would do with with what he's been given. So just give him some time and be patient because I know this is a cliche saying, but Rome wasn't built in a day. It's going to take time, and again, like we talked about, he is hot on this recruiting trail for this next class. He's, I mean, four and five star guys are just rolling in. There's been a bunch of them on official visits. There's been a bunch of them commit already. So just give him time. He, the he is making the right waves in Auburn, and it, it will be there eventually. It's not going to happen overnight. But enough about Auburn. Uh, let's get into this South Carolina Missouri game. If you were to tell me at the beginning of the year that South Carolina was going to be two and five and after week seven and Missouri was going to be seven and one or after week eight and Missouri was going to be seven and one. I'd have told you you're living in an alternate universe and that South Carolina was going to be seven and one and Missouri was going to be two and five. But this Missouri team and Drinkwitz, man, he has got something cooking down there. They are playing. Trust the drink, ball, baby. Man. Trust the drink. I mean, <laughs> I, I was not high drink. on him coming into this, uh, coming into this season. I remember back in previews, Basically, what I was saying was going to happen for South Carolina is happening for Missouri and, and vice versa. So, I mean, they they proved me wrong. They, they made me eat my words. But, I mean, hats off to Drinkwitz and what he's been able to do. Uh, the, he's going to have some recruiting uptick now. I mean, he's, he's been able to get some five-star, four-star guys in there, but not not in a, a flood of them at a time. But uh, the, the recruiting is going to – he's going to have a recruiting uptick for sure a, after this season because, I mean, the man's putting on a show – excuse me, the man's putting on a show. I mean, even the game he lost, he was in it to the last few last few minutes of the game, and it was against, like we said, one of the best offenses in the country. So you, you got to take your hats off to Missouri because they are playing some absolute ball right now. Yeah, we talked about this going into this game. You know, South Carolina's dead last in the country in pass defense. And, you know, they threw the ball with some success, but they, they didn't even, you know, pass it as heavily as I expected because – I'm going to be honest, they were like, why risk it when we can just line up, run it down their throats? Yeah. I mean, they completely dominated the line of scrimmage in this game. Their offensive line was getting a good push. I mean, Cody Schrader had a heck of a game, 26 carries, uh, almost a buck 60, two touchdowns. I mean, he was busting seams left and right. Spencer Rattler eating the dirt again, dude. I mean, this offensive line is absolutely terrible. South Carolina secondary is terrible. Their front mm -hmm. got pushed around, as I just mentioned. I mean, it was just – it was really – the score honestly doesn't do it justice. I mean, it, it was really worse than – like, if you watch this game, it looks worse than 34-12. to 12. Like, it, it oh, really yeah. did. I mean, so I was just really impressed with Missouri. 
Um, I mean, I thought they would win the game, so I wasn't, like, totally shocked. I, I thought South Carolina would have some more success, you know, on offense. I mean, I, I, I figured, you know, I, I texted you, um, you know, after our last uh, podcast late last week, and I was like, man, this this Missouri, you know, uh, South Carolina over, dude, should hit. It's not like at 59, um, you know, and it would have if South Carolina would have got off the bus, but, I mean, I mean – I couldn't believe it, man. 12 points. Uh, like I said, Spencer Rattler just – he's played solid football this year, but when you don't have time to operate, man, it just – it makes it rough on you. I mean, you look at our, our favorite NFL team, Washington Commanders, they have an offensive line about like this. The yep. quarterback's constantly eating dirt, and you can, it just messes up everything. It messes up the entire football. Team when you can't when you can't protect your quarterback like one bit so that was the case in this game really um as I said Missouri just completely dominated both lines of scrimmage and as you said man you got to give so much credit to Drinkwitz man I mean um that they, they've been solid on both sides of the ball you know obviously they had a rough game you know against LSU and that that offense can can run away from you in a hurry but. Missouri, the way their schedule sets up here, you know, they've got a lot of big games left. You know, obviously they got a bye week this week at Georgia next week. Got a CBS doubleheader for Georgia, Missouri, Alabama, LSU. Can't wait for that. Then they host Tennessee and host Florida back to back. So you're talking about, you know, really three of the top teams in the East there. So it's going to be exciting down the stretch. I'm curious to see what kind of damage they can do. You know, can they can they pull off? I, I don't even know if you could call it an upset really against Tennessee or Florida. I mean, they're they're probably those, those games are are going to be, I would say, pretty even spread, especially on that Tennessee game. I yeah. think they'll be favored over Florida. They'll be favored against Arkansas. So they do go to Athens, as I mentioned, in two weeks. So. You know, I, I kind of want to see, like, what damage can they do against some of these teams and, and see how they end this year. But, um, now they're going to be rested. They're going to be confident going into Athens. And Georgia's coming off the Florida game, you know, this weekend. So, we'll see what happens. But um, Missouri's, you know, been well above anybody's expectations so far. I think they've already hit their over win total for the year already. So, I think it was at, like, six and a half or six mm -hmm. or something. So, um but, yeah, we'll see what kind of damage they can do the rest of the way. But, man, so far they have been uh, as good as you could have hoped for, honestly. Yeah, and then uh, the last, like, you know, conference game that was played this past weekend was Mississippi State and Arkansas. And this, I'm not going to lie, this game was an absolute snooze fest, dude. I mean, there was no offense on either side. Granted, um, Will Rogers was hurt. Um on sideline of street clothes. And, I mean, Dan Enos, he got ran out of town after this one, only posted three points against – I mean, Mississippi State's not a bad defense, but they're not no showstoppers by no means. Uh, I mean, they, they've they given up lots of points to lots of teams this year, and Arkansas couldn't muster but three points. I, it, it, Mind-blowing. I thought Arkansas was finally going to get back on track on, after the, on this game this week. I – I thought they were a better team than Mississippi State. Like I said, they've been in a lot of games. Um, I don't think we realize how many one one score games that Arkansas's been in. I heard a stat today that um, uh, Sam Pittman is twenty one and twenty three in his time in Arkansas. But if he was to win all of his one score games, he would be thirty five and nine. That's insane. That is a crazy stat line. So that just shows you how many games they've been in in a one possession game. Like I said, I've said this till my eyeballs roll in the back of my head. Arkansas is in every single game they've played. They just can't find a way to finish it. But this week, I mean, it's still a one possession game. I didn't feel like they were in it at all this week. They couldn't get anything going. They had 97 yards the air and 103 yards on the ground I mean they literally could not get anything moving they couldn't sustain a drive worth nothing their offensive line feels like it's falling apart at the seams um this was just a I mean honestly no hate to either one of these teams but this was a snooze fest of a football game 
but it, it was ugly. And and to be honest, too, like late in the game, Mississippi State, you know, has a pretty good drive, drives down into deep in Arkansas territory to put it at a seven point game and misses a chip shot field goal. <laughs> I mean, it, like Mississippi State gave them several opportunities to stay in the game or, you know, have a drive. And I mean, it's like neither team wanted to put a wrap on it. I mean, honestly, like each each team kept giving the other one chances to go up by a score or, you know, and all I mean, that. You're telling me you scored 21 points against Alabama last week and you can't muster a single touchdown against Mississippi State? I was I was blown away. I really was. Yeah, they're like you said, they – their run game was non-existent. I mean, their offensive line is just is just playing bad. Uh, there's yeah. just no other way to put it. And that's that's the one thing too. Like you're starting to hear a little heat turned up on Sam Pittman. I feel like that's a good a, a big reason of it too. Is you know he's known as an offensive line guy. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of like Gus was at Auburn. Like he was an offensive guy, and his defense kept carrying it. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? It's like. You're, you're Sam Pittman, you know, you've been an offensive line guy your entire life, and, like, that's, like, the worst unit on your team. Yeah. Basically. So, it's like – long, long shot. Yeah, and I don't think he's getting run off, but I do I do think – I think they're going to give him a chance to make some changes, which I think this was the first step in doing that. Dan Enos out the door, as you mentioned, on Sunday morning. Um, I think – you know, according to some of the Arkansas, you know, reporters and people within the program, like there's going to be some other staff turnover, it seems. So I think they're going to give him an opportunity to to make some changes. Um, so I, I don't think it'll be this year, but I, I do think, you know, like I said, but when you, you know, when you're two and two and six now, you've lot, you know, even though you're in these games, man, it's which is good in one way, but. Man, they don't pay you to come close, you know. Nope. I mean, it, it's the SEC. Got to so finish. Got to finish. Um, but yeah, I, I think they're going to give him an opportunity to 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 make the necessary changes and, and give him a chance to do that. But there's definitely some people, obviously, you know, in, in this games like this too. You know, like okay, you come close, but you don't get the job done against Alabama. I think most people like okay, you know, they kind of understand that, but. When you're at home against a Mississippi State team that's not great, they come in and only score seven, and you can't even win. And I mean, it, that's just it's just bad. But yeah, the offensive line's just just really been the biggest disappointment. I feel like they couldn't lean on the run game at all, and and they just they had to really lean too much on their pass game, and they just they couldn't sustain anything, as you mentioned. So. And like I said, Mississippi State gave them a chance to hang in it at the end. Um, they had Mississippi State backed up in their own territory late. And then Mike Wright throws a deep ball down the left sideline. He jumps over two guys and, and comes down with a 30, 40 yard reception. And on third and long, it's just things like that are just back breakers. I thought with Mississippi State, though, even though they only scored seven, but. I like what they did in the quarterback run game. You know, mm-hmm. Mike Wright, I thought, had some really good scrambles. They obviously couldn't really, you know, sustain or, or finish drives themselves. But I thought they did a good job with that. Thought he thought he made a couple, you know, pretty nice throws too. So obviously nothing, nothing crazy. But um, but I thought they did they did well with the quarterback runs, and at least for the most part, they weren't scoring, but they kept Arkansas backed up in their own territory more often than not. So mm-hmm. I thought that was helpful. Their defense obviously was playing really well and, and both did. It was just sloppy offensively. But yeah, it, it it was it was a pretty bad product overall. But we'll see what else happens with Arkansas going forward and see see what kind of changes are made the rest of the way or, or maybe at the end of, or maybe after the season. But if you're Mississippi State though, you'll take a, a SEC win any way you can get it. You're four and three. Moving on, you go to Jordan Hare this weekend. Obviously, probably going to be in, you know another pretty tight spread. So, you know, you kind of take it, see what you can do this week, and moving forward. But, but yeah, it's it pretty sloppy overall. <laughs> and another sloppy game in, in college football this weekend. Sloppy for one team anyway, and for what their expectations are, and what we've seen them do in the past. 
USC, man, they fall to Utah again. Caleb Williams, 0-3 against Utah. Utah is Caleb Williams' daddy. That's all I'm going to say. But I'm sure all of you ha- have heard about this, and it's it's been making its rounds over the sports media today. But Emmanuel Acho played college football, played in the NFL, tweets this. With national championship hopes gone, Caleb Williams should consider sitting out the rest of the season. The Heisman is a long shot. College football playoffs are even less than likely, and he won't play in the bowl game. The risk of playing far outweighs the reward. Business decision. Now, you want to get me on a soapbox. You put that in front of my face and let me read it. This dude right here is not a Stephen A. He's not a Skip Bayless, a guy that's not played, a, a guy that's, you know, not been in the in the locker room around the guys. This man was in it, went through it. And he's saying, at week eight, to quit playing the rest of the season. Because by all means, this is a one-man show down there at USC. It's not a team down there at all. I mean, it, absolutely ridiculous. Fires me up. You're telling this man to quit on his players and quit on his teammates because he's lost again and he's not going to play in the national championship. He's not going to win the Heisman. Do you know how many freaking players in college football are not going to play for a national championship and are not going to win the Heisman? There's one Heisman winner. There's 400-something college players, maybe more than that. I'm sure there's more than that. There's two teams that play for the championship, make it four that go to the playoff, and there's 130 three teams, 132 D1 teams, get the hell out of here with that BS, dude. I mean, it is absolutely atrocious that you say that Caleb Williams should sit out because the risk far outweigh the rewards. Not at all. The dude is a an, an generational talent for sure. Now, he's been – he's not my favorite because the way he carries himself at times and some of the things he's asked and saying, well, I'm only going to play for four teams in the NFL and if they don't take me – uh, I'm going to go back to college because I can make more money in college anyway, or I want partial ownership of the team, whoever drafts me. And I'll, like, the dude's acting like he's Tom Brady, and he ain't never even got drafted yet. I mean, it's a bit ridiculous. But to say that he should just leave his teammates high and dry, the guys that are fighting alongside him, this is not the USC Caleb Williams. It's the USC freaking Trojans, dude. Like, the fact that, that a former player is saying this and condoning this is absolutely absurd, dude. It pisses me off because that's not what sports is about. It's not what a team is about. You don't put – you're not – no one on the team is higher than the team. I mean, look at Bryce Young last year. Not going to not gonna win the Heisman. Still plays throughout the rest of the year and gets drafted number one overall. Like, what What if Bryce Young would have said, nah, I'm done. I, I'm not playing. I mean, when, when, they're, when his Heisman – hopes were done for and he realized he wasn't going to win the national championship i mean what in the hell is wrong with this dude it is week eight like it's not it's not prep we're not we're not prepping for bowl season now like this is not the time where people were talking about sitting out this is the middle of the freaking season he's still got a bunch of big games lined up like you're just going to quit on your team like that what are you going to do one day uh when your wife gets sick or your kids get sick and they're depending on you to, to go to work but man you wake up you don't feel good you don't feel like you want to go to work one day because the odds are stacked against you you're just going to let your freaking family fail you're going to let them down because well i'm better than them they're depending on me I, I, they, I, they need me i don't need them what the hell kind of mindset is that dude i mean that is the weakest shit i have heard in a long time it fires me up dude uh, I know I played baseball, not football, but if one of my teammates, if we would have been out of the conference talk or out of a, a postseason play talk, they'd have been like, nah, I'm good. I'm better than you guys. I, I'm not going to hurt myself playing for, for no reason. Dude, we would have beat his ass. I mean, this shit is ridiculous, dude. I, mean, I want to hear your thoughts on it because I'm going to keep rambling on, but yeah. when I read that, it fired me up, bro. And I, I'm not even on a team. I, I'm not saying that Caleb Williams is saying this because he has not come out and said this, not even notion to it at all. But the fact that a former player, an NFL player, is condoning this and saying this is what should happen is abysmal. Yeah, this this would be like – and like you said, too, Caleb Williams hasn't hinted at this, hasn't – you know, that this this was just mentioned by Emmanuel Acho. So I don't want to like, act like I'm throwing off on Caleb Williams. No, not at all. Just saying like if this hypothetically – 
you know, were the case. But like, it, it would be like Bryce Young last year, Alabama, the second Alabama lost to LSU, go, well, I'm going to get ready for the draft. Y'all have at it. Like, yeah. we got two losses. We're more than likely done. You know, we're not going to win the SEC. We're not, you know, going to make the playoffs. Um, not going to win the Heisman. So, I'm going to let y'all have, like, and here's the thing. What, what almost sickened me as m- more than that was just, like, you had after the regular season, and and obviously, you know, Alabama comes just short of making the playoffs. They were the fifth seed and all that. Well, they go to the Sugar Bowl. And all the media talked about for weeks and weeks and weeks as they were waiting to hear what him and Will Anderson were going to do, it's like they were pushing him to sit out. It was yeah. like they were almost like, like, oh my, like he's at, he, like they were shocked that he was actually going to play. It, it was like, you're playing. What are you doing? Like the dude cares about his team, man. And to be honest, that he went out, had a great performance against Kansas State as Will Anderson did, and and all he did was help himself. Yep. And he proved to NFL teams that, like, hey, through thick and thin, this guy will hang with you. Like, think what message that sends to NFL teams when you when you're get your second loss. We're not even to November yet, and you just packing in for the rest of the season. To me, this would hurt your draft stock more than help. You know, I mean, yeah, you save yourself from injury, but – the fact that you just bail on your guys, like how are you going to earn anybody's respect doing that? How are you going to be a? How are you going to lead a team when you yeah. just bail on? Like if if he were to do that, yeah, just 100%. like like Emmanuel Acho suggests he should. I just think the entire idea is ludicrous, man. It just, it sets such a bad precedent too, because like you didn't see any of these opt outs until the last few years, until all these talking heads started suggesting it. And and like like I said, a guy like this who's been in these battles and been in these locker rooms and played at a high level, it's like you're just condoning that and acting like that's okay. I just it just sets a terrible precedent, man. Because Kale Williams may not do it, but I guarantee you somebody before too long will do it. Yep, that may be in his situation, and I I just think it sets a, a terrible precedent for. You know, just the sport in general. I hope that doesn't start happening. Um, I know the bowl, you know, people opting out bowl games. I, I know that's kind of here to stay, but I hope it doesn't become a thing. Or Not where, for the regular where, season, man. I mean, that's what you're practicing honest, for. Dude. That's what the workouts are for. That's what you go through hell with your teammates for. It's a team game. It's not a singular person game. Like, that. This is what life is about. It's bigger than football. I, 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 it blows my mind that he said that. And to be honest, too, what's the odds, too? He gets like a career ending injury. And like, even, even if he did get hurt a little bit or whatever, like twist a knee or whatever, or Lord forbid he has an ACL injury or something, is it really going to hurt? I mean, it's not really like, a team still bank, they're banking on your future value. Yeah. Like, yeah, they take you number one overall, but they're they're banking on what you're gonna be, not mm-hmm. necessarily what you are to start off with. You know and what I mean? At like, the quarterback position in today's game, it's probably the safest position to play in all sports. You have so much; they have so much protection around you, and the the way they call penalties and stuff. I mean, you get shoved at ten seconds or two seconds after you throw the ball, you get shoved a little hard. They're going to call rough in the pass. I mean, they they go to lengths to protect the quarterback in today's game. Like the odds of him getting hurt are are just as high, or probably not even as high as him getting you know in a car accident or something. I'm not wishing that on. I'm just saying like that that's real thing. Like, I mean, he could get in an accident. He could trip and fall down the stairs. I mean, anything can happen. You can get hurt any day, any time of the day. Like, I, basing it off of a hypothetical injury that could happen, that's the weakest way to play football. If you go into every game saying, well, I could get hurt, that you're probably going to get hurt. If you play scared, you're going to get hurt. Like, it's, again, nothing. none of this is at Caleb Williams because he has not noted and, and gone to this at all, and nothing. Of the, none of that has came out of his mouth, and he's not – said that he's going to do that. There's been nothing. It's just the fact that this is an actual talking point from a former athlete is mind-blowing because all sports are 
team oriented and they're bigger than one person, no matter who that person is, they are bigger than that one person. And this guy's making it all about one guy. Like, yeah, that might be the catalyst of the team, but he is not the team. Well, I want to say this too. I mean, Caleb Williams obviously is a great quarterback, great talent, but be honest, he's still got something to prove. Like his stats against ranked teams aren't that great. No. They, hey, they haven't even played Washington yet. They haven't played Oregon yet. They haven't played UCLA yet. Like all of those teams right now are better than USC is right now. By a long so, shot. And and here's the thing, and I kind of want to make a broader point kind of transitioning to USC as a whole right now. Obviously, Ohio State beats Penn State this past weekend, 20-12. to They've now won two highly ranked games where they score 20 or less. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, that never would have happened with Ohio State. I think USC finds them – they're in that same position that Ohio State was in really even this past offseason. Ohio State looked themselves in the mirror and like, okay, we're going ma- we're going to make a legit commitment to improve our defense. They have made leaps and bounds improvement on that side of the ball, and they're winning games now in a style they never would have won them before. USC finds themselves in the exact same position. They have to make a legit commitment to defense, or this same cycle that's went on with Lincoln Riley is going to continue. I mean, because as I said, there is no, there is no win like there's no easy game for them the rest of the way. Cal is probably gonna play them tough. Like Cal's decent. Washington, Oregon, UCLA—that's their final three regular season games—are all better than them right now. Like mm-hmm. if they played tonight, all three of those teams will beat them. So they're really gonna have to take a long look in the mirror. I think Alex Grinch is the dude should have been so long gone anyway. I don't know how that guy is a defensive coordinator at in a major college football level. I, how he has gotten away with just an atrocious defense year after year after year and retained a job and made the kind of salary he's made is just absolutely ludicrous. <laughs> Alex Grinch would be – Alex Grinch would probably have never been hired by me but with this kind of product he puts on the field, and and it may not be all his fault because he does coach under Lincoln Riley, and they really don't put a huge emphasis on defense. So That's maybe right. it's not totally his fault. I don't know. Still don't think he can coordinate his ass out of a wet paper bag, to be honest <laughs> with you. <laughs> I think he is toast. He's definitely gone. There's no doubt. But they got to look themselves in the mirror and make a legit commitment to put emphasis on that side of the ball. Uh, Because if they don't, like I said, they're never – Lincoln Riley will never get over the hump at, you know, a major level. You know, he's made playoffs, but he won't win a championship. Or really, frankly, even come that close unless they get uh, leaps and bounds better defensively. I mean, they don't have to be a top-ten defense, but you've got to make a commitment on that side of the ball. And they just have not done it. And – like I said, until they do that, I don't I don't think things are going to change for them. But I do want to see, though, how they kind of come together the rest of the year because when you watch them, it doesn't – it just doesn't seem like a team that's really gelling, honestly. It mm-hmm. just looks like a bunch of guys out there playing. Like, it doesn't seem a team that's really together or gelling together. It, it just seems like a bunch of individuals out there playing, honestly. So I kind of want to see if this second loss, if it really tanks them. Because like I said, man, that, that schedule is pretty tough because the Pac-12 is playing really competitive football right now. So I want to see what happens the rest of the way. But but changes are going to happen definitely out at Southern Cal by the end of this year for sure. Because, um, yeah, especially if they drop a few of those, they're they're going to be very, very uneasy. A hundred percent. And while we're complaining about things on the football realm, I know this is NFL, but I got, I got, I say something. So the Philadelphia Eagles and the tush push, it has been a hot commodity this, this football season. I mean, they are the best at the tush push. There's been other teams try it and there's no other teams succeed at it, but every single time there is a third and short or fourth and short, 
you can guarantee the Eagles are going to line it up and they're going to push Jalen to the first down. It happened five or six times in last night's game. Now, all the people that are saying it is not a football play, that it's not football, wrong. I want these people. I tweeted it. You can go check out my my Twitter, uh, Cardin underscore Malone. If you go back and you look at the first ever filmed football game, it's Yale and Princeton. 95% of the plays that they're running is the tush push. They're scrumming at the line, and they're going inching down the field, just little by little. To me, it is the most football football play that there's ever been. They're going back to the roots of when football was created. You just line up and you muscle the man in front of you and get a couple yards and you do it again. These people saying it's not football because they're mad that the Philadelphia Eagles are doing it to their team drives me nuts. Again, it is it is about as much of a football play as a football play can get. They're just, I'm better than you, I'm stronger than you, and I'm going to m- m- use my manpower to force you down the field and get what I want. And that's a first down. And so the people saying it's not a football play piss me off because they've clearly never looked into football and when it was first originated. Because like I said, the first ever film game was Yale and Princeton and 95% of the plays they were running was the tush push. It, well, it, might, it might not have been as organized of a tush push as what it is nowadays, but 1000% it was the tush push. So it is the football play. It's what the game was built around. So shut the hell up with that complaining just get better at it or find a way to stop it because it, it 1,000% is the most football football play there is out there. Yeah. The main thing is you got to keep them out of third and short. You know? <laughs> exactly. You got to do better on first and second downs or, or and third down where that where they don't – are able to run that. But, yeah, I mean, it kind of reminds me, you've heard that saying all the time, like three yards in a cloud of dust. Like, that's basically what from? it is, man. <laughs> like, that, that, was, uh, that was football, you know, back in the – you know, 19, like 1910, 1920, you know, it was just, it was just uh, three yards here, three yards there. But 1, yeah, I, I don't, I don't agree with banning yet. I, I think people just see, I mean, give them credit. They've kind of not, I don't really want to say a loophole, but they found something that's nearly unstoppable. Well, you know, if you run if it. We're off that, let's ban the deep ball to Tyreek Hill. Nobody can keep up with him. He's faster than everybody. Nobody can stop it. Ban it. No longer allowed in football because we can't stop it. That is the weak – everything in today's world is going to a weak-ass mindset. It's pissing me off. Get better. Yeah. Quit being a yeah. wuss and wanting everything changed to, to, to condone to your feelings. Just get better and stop it. God. Uh, I know, yeah, that's that's a big topic right now. But um, I tell you what, we've got some – obviously, we're kind of in that point of the year, too, where – some teams are on their bye weeks, you know, obviously this week and or this past week and this upcoming week, a little bit lighter SEC schedule, obviously, than, than will be. Um, no, Auburn just had their bye week four last. Alabama's on their bye this week. LSU had their bye. their bye a few weeks ago. Yeah, so you're kind of in that, that point of the season, those few weeks where, you know, we have some bye weeks. But kind of looking ahead this week, obviously Florida, Georgia, Got to get your thoughts on this. Obviously, Florida's, you know, had their ups and downs, but I feel like for the most part they've overachieved so far. Now that Brock Bowers is out, at least for the foreseeable future, you know, that's really been Georgia's main, you know, source of offense, really, especially when they're throwing the football. Like, that's kind of been one of their, you know, areas of their team they're trying to develop is get guys alongside of Brock Bowers to step up. So, kind of, what are you expecting now that he's out? And do you think Florida can kind of keep this game close and, and make it interesting? The spread's 14 and a half right now. Do you, do you think they can keep it close even with Bowers out? I honestly know just for the sole purpose of Georgia's defense, man. They are so fast. that uh, They're fundamentally sound. They do everything right. Rarely do they make mistakes. The last time they were a 14-and-a-half-point favorite against a conference team, they blew them out of the water. I think Kentucky um, I think Kentucky and Florida are about the same type of football team. Uh, I mean, obviously, Florida throws it a little bit better. But when it, when it comes to roster-wise and just the, the type of – or the, the caliber of team, 
Um, I think they're about the same. I think Georgia has their way. It is a, a, a neutral site, so you know that changes things. But Georgia's coming off their bye week this week. Um, you know they've they they repped a bunch of things under Kirby Smart to get better. He's not going to let them, uh, you know, be content in, in how their their season is right now. They're seven and zero, but this is you know this is one of their biggest games every year. You know it's a big time heated rivalry. I I think Florida has a chance to keep it close early just for the sole purpose of Georgia's other than the Kentucky game. They've started out slow offensively in every game, especially now not having Brock Bowers. Uh, You might could see that happen again. But this isn't a game that you have to get guys up for. This isn't a game that you have to make sure guys are locked in for and, and, you know, make sure that they're they're treating it like it it is a big game. It's not a nobody I think Georgia's going to come out, play some smash mouth football like like we're used to seeing, and I think they win this game handily. I really do, and it's just basically or, or solely just because of their defense, man. Uh, this is one of the best defenses in college football. They they consistently find ways to win, and and even if they are getting beat defensively, they're going to find a way to keep it keep it a close ball game where our offense is going to be able to get them back in it, or they'll for, force a turnover, have a defensive touchdown. I mean, the things that we're just used to seeing a Kirby Smart-led defense do, um, I don't see that changing. I think Florida is a better team than what I thought they were going to be this year, for sure. I took the under five and a half. They're probably going to lose me money. But I think Georgia is, again, it's like the Kentucky game. You could just see something different about them. They were they were locked in from the first snap. They, they knew that this was a, a monumental game in their season that, you know, with where Kentucky was at the time uh, to, to what Florida is right now. They're, they're, they're kind of having some hype around college football media and stuff. They're, they're going to come out and prove that Florida doesn't belong on the field with them and that they're still the top dogs of the conference and, and of college football. So I think Georgia covers this spread. I'm probably going to put some money on Georgia to cover this spread, um, even with Brock Bowers out, because Georgia still got talent all around the football field. They might be inexperienced, but – I mean, it's week nine now. There's that inexperience. It's not not much of an excuse anymore. I mean, you've played nine games or eight games, so I, yeah, they're ready. And I I expect Georgia and, and Carson back to to march it down the field with ease. I'm gonna be real. Like I I just don't think that Florida's got the the guys and, and the the how to to stop them. I think Georgia wins this game. Honestly, I mean. I, I don't have a great feel. I mean, in one way, I feel like it could be a little closer than people think. And then on the another hand, I'm kind of like you. I think Georgia's could come out and take care of business. I think, you know, you look back at that all. You know, the thing about it, that what's hard to read on this game is, like, I'm just – I'm not sure what Florida team I'm going to get. You know what I mean? It's just kind of Fair. been like I, – I feel like, you know, if we get one of the best versions of Florida that we've seen some at times this year, I think this could be a, a competitive game. You know, if we if we don't get that version, then I don't think it's going to be that close, honestly. You know, I, I could, on one hand, like I said, I could see it being like that Auburn game that, you know, Georgia just kind of struggling to move it a little bit, you know. And to be honest, without Brock Bowers, Georgia doesn't win at Auburn. Nope. I mean, he won them that game at, in the fourth quarter. So, we'll see. I'm kind of like you, though. I, I think – I don't think it's a blowout necessarily, but I, I do think Georgia wins it fairly comfortably. Um, I, I, I think Florida can hang in for a bit, move the ball maybe a little bit, and, and kind of kind of like Auburn did and, 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 you know, keep it a ball game for a little while. But I do think in the end, Georgia wins up, ends up winning fairly comfortably. I just think a lot of scrimmage, they're just so much better than what Florida is right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, their their rosters, you know, way ahead of what, you know, what Florida's is. So like I said, if if Florida plays, you know, um one of their better games, you know, kinda like they did against Tennessee, you know, they if they're able to kind of have that game plan with that level of success, I could see them keeping it, you know, a, a pretty tight ball game. But I just think in the end, Georgia's just a little bit too much defensively. Uh, on the line of scrimmage, I, I just think it, it's too much. But but I think at least for a while it can be a competitive game. I hope it is. It'd be fun to see. It, it's always um, more exciting when this game is competitive. It's a great rivalry. Um, 
you know, so I, I'm hoping it's able to stay pretty competitive. Um, but but we'll see. Um, I got to get your thoughts, though, on, on Auburn, Mississippi State. You know, we've talked about, you know, Auburn's schedule. You know, these next four weeks is a chance for them to really, you know, rack up a few Ws. Do you think they're able to do that this week? And do you like them to cover the six and a half? Or do you think that's a little bit too much? I don't know about the covering the six and a half just solely off of Auburn's offense is just so inconsistent. Um, I do think that they get back in the win column. I think they right some wrongs this week, especially if Will Rogers is out. Um, Auburn's done a decent job of being able to slow down the runs. I mean, this past week, Ole Miss ran all over them. Um, Georgia was able to run the ball pretty well against them. But for the most part, they're not just getting slashed at all game, every game. So I feel like if they can contain the, the run game, which is, you know, what we've talked about multiple times with, with Mississippi State, that's what they want to establish. Um, if Mike Wright's in there, just being able to contain uh, his athleticism and his ability to run and, and force him to throw the ball, I, I like it. I like Auburn's chances because Auburn's secondary, and they're ball hawks, man. They, they can get some interceptions. You know, they can they can flip the field and get the, get the offense back on the field. It's just can Auburn's offense sustain drives? Uh, I expect Auburn to be able to run the ball a little bit. They're going to have to lean on the run game, like you said, give Jarquez some more carries. Um, I, I, I'm not super confident on covering, but I do think Auburn gets it done because it is at home. If it was at Mississippi State, I'd be a little more worried. I'm not saying I'm just solely confident that Auburn's winning this game, but I would be a little more worried if it wasn't at home. But – this is the Auburn's first time being favored against the SEC school this year. Um, I think that they're a better team. I really do. So I, I think Auburn gets it done, but it's it's going to have to be – defense is going to have to step up and, and carry us the way they've been carrying them all, all year. But the, the run game is going to have to come to life. They're going to have to find a way to, to sustain drives and march the ball down the field. Um, and, and Auburn's been able to do that with the run game at times this year when we talked about – uh, the Georgia game, at, at times they were able to move the ball on the ground um, against Ole Miss this past weekend. So it's, can can Auburn build on that and, and get better at that? Because when, when they're able to do it, they look really, really good. But it's just the inconsistency is what, what frightens me a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, though. I, I'm not sure about the spread, but I do think Auburn gets in a win column uh, in this game. Like I said, being at home, um, they've lost four straight, think they're desperate for a win. Um, like I said, Mississippi State, especially if it's Mike Wright starting, you know, obviously Will Rogers, not sure about his status. He may be back. He's got a shoulder injury. Um, so we'll, we'll see, you know, as the, as the week goes on, if we, we hear about his status. But, um, but I'm like you, I, I do think Auburn gets back in the win column here. I think their offense does enough. I think it's going to be a lower scoring type of game. I mean, that is kind of a, a recipe for that. But um, I think Auburn does enough on the ground, hits hits a few pass plays when needed. Um, and I, I think their defense is, is going to be able to hold Mississippi State down a little bit. Um, I, I want to see Mississippi State. I'd like to see Tulu Griffin get some more touches, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. I think he had five in this Arkansas game. Uh, I think they need to get the ball in his hands a little bit uh, more. And then uh, Jaquavius Marks, I think he's been running the ball really hard too. So they've got a few pieces there on offense, but I, I think I think Auburn's offense will do enough to to alleviate that pressure off their defense. And uh, I, I think they do enough at home to get the win. One guy I am terrified for this weekend, Spencer Rattler. Oh I mean, yeah, absolutely. they're playing Texas A and M, and we just thought that he was getting sacked a lot all the other games this year, Texas A&M is going to have a field day if South Carolina's offense can't do something or their offensive line can't change drastically this week. He, I mean, I believe they're second in, in sacks in the SEC. Uh, they may be first, but I believe that they're second. They get quarterback pressures damn near every play that there's a drop back uh, on the team that they're playing against. So, Spencer Rattler is going to have to uh, become a track meet star this week because he's going to be running for his life. And like we alluded to early in the podcast, he's probably going to be eating a lot of dirt this week because this Texas A&M team, four and three, not really lived up to the expectations, but that defense, man, they are legit. They're for real 1,000%, no way around it. Yeah, I think too, 
you know, I, I think ten, Tennessee's defense, I think they're up there in sacks as well, mm-hmm. kind of with A&M. Those lead, two yeah. teams are up there in sacks. Um, yeah, I, I think um, unless Shane Beamer can somehow get the Philadelphia Eagles offensive line to come play <laughs> for him this week, I do, I do not see their offensive line getting any better. They're kind of banged up on top of yeah. it anyway, so it's just – it's going to be a rough go, I'm afraid. For the, I mean, if they just went to Columbia, the Mayor Cup, only put up 12 points, I I just don't see them going to College Station and having much success against this defense, honestly. Yeah. I, I think I think the spread's about right. I, I think A&M ends up I, – I just – like you said, unless they just get drastically better on the offensive side of the ball, especially up front. Now, they do have the athletes to make some plays. If it was a 7-on-7 seven – seven, South Carolina will be favored every week. Yeah, but like I said, I just don't know if they're going to have the time to get the ball to the playmakers like they want against this A&M front. So, I don't yeah, think he, they're going to be able to run the ball either. Yeah, if for some reason he gets time or something, or for some reason they put flags on him or something, you know, maybe maybe he can get them to his playmakers because there's plays to be made on A&M secondary. I mean, when Alabama held up on them, they hit some plays down the field, so – uh, Miami, you know, obviously they had time to throw the ball down the field where they were able to make some plays. So, you know, if, if Beamer can roll him out of the pocket a little bit, maybe give him some plays down the field, you know, have a possibility of hanging in. But I just think this A&M front's just too much. I, th- I think they end up pulling away from South Carolina. Absolutely. Is there anything else you want to cover? I do want to talk about this Tennessee-Kentucky game mm-hmm. just a little bit. It's a night game on ESPN. I want to see how Tennessee bounces back. Um, Kentucky, like I said, has been on a little bit of a slide. You know, they they were playing really good football kind of up until they went to Athens, to be honest with you. You know, they ran into a bus all in Athens, and then they came back. We thought they bounced back against Missouri, and and I give them, I give Missouri a lot of credit. Like, they're obviously a lot better than, than we thought or anybody else thought they would be. I think they've – They've more than exceeded expectations. So, you know, they didn't have a great performance at home against Missouri, and Missouri pulled away from them in the second half. So they're coming off a bye. So I want to see how they how they bounce back, you know, coming off a bye and, and two frustrating, disappointing losses. And then Tennessee obviously coming off a disappointing, you know, second half as well. So I want to see how both those teams respond. It's in Lexington. Give me your pick on this game. It's right now. It's Tennessee's minus three and a half. You think they get the jump, get the job done there and cover, or you think Kentucky kind of bounces back after two disappointing games? I think Tennessee gets the job done. I think they cover, and it's solely because their defense and the pressure they're going to be able to get on Devin Leary. And Devin Leary has done nothing to impress me this year. Um, I mean, absolutely nothing. So he's a about as average of a quarterback as you can be this season so far. Um, unless he just comes out and he plays, you know, like Peyton Manning or, or Tom Brady, I just don't see it happening. Uh, Tennessee's defense, like we just spoke about, you know, they're up there in, in sacks. I believe they may lead the, the, the conference in sacks. Uh, if they're not one, they're two. It's them and, them and Texas A&M. They're going to get to the quarterback. And Devin Leary has just done nothing to prove to me that, that he can sustain those or sustain that pressure and continue drive down the field and get rid of the ball and, and make plays when, when he's under some heat. I just – I think Tennessee is going to win this game. I don't think Kentucky is going to be able to run all over them the way they did Florida a couple weeks ago. Uh, I, I think this is a match made for Tennessee to be successful in for sure. I, I think the number is a little too low, to be honest with you. I, I thought it would be like a six-and-a-half, seven-and-a-half point spread. So I would probably bang Tennessee uh, minus three and a half for sure. Yeah, I think they're going to get pressure on on Devin Leary. I think they can slow that run game down. We know Kentucky wants to to pound the ball with, with Ray Davis, and um, yeah, I, I think Tennessee can have some success on the ground too. I think they bounce back kind of in that uh, aspect as well. So yeah, I like Tennessee here in this spot. I mean, I know Tennessee has two conference losses, so. You know, obviously kind of kind of out of the, the SEC East race, but they still got Missouri on the schedule. They still got Georgia. Like, there's still so much to play for here. So, I don't think there's going to really be any letdown from their perspective. I, th- I think they're going to be ready to go. Um, I, I think they get the road win um, this week. So, um, 
that's pretty much – we got Vandy and Ole Miss as well. I, I think Ole Miss is, is playing at a super high level right now offensively. It's in Oxford. Ole Miss is a – and a half. Yeah, 25 and a half. Pretty, pretty steep line there. I, I think they're going to roll, though. Just don't think Vandy can hang with this offense at all. Ole Miss defense playing a little bit better, too. So, um, And Ole Miss, man, I mean, you, you, you look at them going forward, too. I mean, they got to go to Athens. They uh they host a big game against uh Texas A and M here um next Saturday. So um obviously the egg bowl at the end of the year. So I mean it sets up well for them. Like they've got a chance to really make a statement uh, down the stretch. I mean, they're sitting at twelve in the AP poll. They're six and one on the season, only the one conference loss. So everything's still ahead for them too. I mean, if LSU beats Alabama, Ole Miss beat LSU head to head. So I mean, oh, you know Ole Miss is going to be the biggest LSU fans next week. The biggest. Oh, no doubt about it. And they've got a chance to beat I, – I can't remember how all the tiebreaker scenarios go. I think part of the tiebreaker scenario is going off your record against the other division, I think, mm-hmm. is part of the criteria. It, it's a long list of criteria. But, um, but yeah, I mean, Ole Miss is – I mean, Ole Miss is in the thick of it. It's just about anybody. So, and they've got everything ahead of them with some – really big time games here in the next few weeks. So um I, I, I think I think they take care of business and get ready for a big home matchup against A and M next week. Absolutely. Well I I pre- we appreciate everybody tuning in. Be sure to like and subscribe our, our YouTube channel. Um we really appreciate you know everybody tuning in. Uh hope everybody enjoys week nine. We'll be back next week to recap it. Um man just looking ahead to week ten a little bit Got a huge one on that. Get past some of the bye weeks a little bit for for a few teams. You get into early November, man, that that week 10. Week 9's going to be good, but week 10 already setting up to be real nice. So, y'all be sure to keep tuning in. Uh, Man, these conference, not just the SEC, but you look at the ACC's tightening up, the Big 12's tightening up. Pac-12 still about as chaotic as any conference. So, um, yeah, y- y- y'all tune in because we're really just getting started. So we-, we appreciate everybody tuning in, though. We'll catch y'all next week. Thank you, guys.